Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm going to get started here. So I'm uh, Ed Osborne, associate professor in the visual art department. And um, we're really happy here today to present uh, Mendy and Keith Obadike um, for a special lecture um, in the department. Um, when, I, uh, when I arrived at Brown, following several years working at a, a lovely but financially challenged institution, um, one of the things that I enjoyed most was the sudden ability to invite artists um, whose work I, I, uh, and practice I greatly admire. Um, Mendy and Keith were at the top of my invitation list. Um, and they first visited the, the department here almost exactly seven years ago today, and I'm really happy to have them join us again. Uh, Mendy and Keith uh, make art, music, and literature. Their projects include a series of large-scale public sound artworks, um, some of which they'll talk about today, Blues Speaker for James Baldwin at the New School in New York, uh, Free Phase at the Chicago Cultural Center, and upcoming projects uh, Sonic Migration in Philadelphia, and Ring Shout for Octavia Butler at the Armory Center for the Arts in Pasadena uh, later this year. They've contrib contributed sound and music to projects by a wide range of artists, including Loops for Soul Singer D'Angelo's first album, and a score for playwright Anna DeVere Smith at the Lincoln Center Institute. They were invited to develop their first uh, opera, opera masquerade, as they term it, by writer Toni Morrison at her Princeton Atelier. Um, their gallery exhibitions are numerous and include uh, the Numbers Station, Furtive Movements at the Ryan Lee Gallery in New York last year, and the current group show, Electronic Superhighway 2016 to 1966 at the Whitechapel Gallery in London, which is a, it looks to be a great show if you can uh, check out any of it online. Um, they recently received the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Biennial Award. Keith earned a BA in art from North Carolina Central University and an MFA in sound design uh, from Yale. He's an associate professor in the College of Arts and Communication at William Patterson University and serves as an art advisor for the Times Square Alliance. Mendy received a BA in English from Spelman College and a PhD in literature from Duke University. After working at the Kotzen Postdoctoral Fellow in Princeton, she became a poetry editor at Fence Magazine and an assistant professor in the Department of Humanities and Media Studies at Pratt. Mendy and Keith are currently developing a sound installation series, African Metropole, Sonic City, an intermedia series entitled American Suites, and a new series of performance works. Their work looks at and makes audible some of the meeting points among digital and cultural networks as it relates to blackness. They describe it as being about finding personal ways to examine persistent questions in our culture and then making that process accessible. They also note that all of our works spring from a dialogue about things that are just at the edge of language. It is perhaps for this reason that their work often features a sharp twinning of abstraction and materiality whether in the act of Keith putting his blackness for sale on eBay, or in the sound of Sally Hemings' bell, which is used as the material for a composition derived from both the Hemings, Hemings and Thomas Jefferson's genetic code, their work functions as both a sign and a calling, at once a statement of condition and an invitation to engagement. The strength of their practice comes from a deeply considered lived experience, one that allows a natural production of art from life and one that sustains both life and art. Their work and working methodologies evidence rigor and insight, clarity and grace, and substantial amounts of joy. It is with great pleasure that we, we welcome Keith Mendy and Keith Obadike to Brown University. Thank you for that introduction, Ed, that was wonderful. Thank you. Well, we're really happy to be here, and um, it means a lot to be back at Brown and, and, and to be brought by Ed. We've been fans of Ed's work for a long time, and we've enjoyed you know, our visits here in the past. Mm -hmm. um, what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about our practice and show you um, some works from maybe the last 10 years of our practice. We've worked together for a little bit over 20 years. Um, and during that time, we've been investigating the ways that art, music, and literature can function together. And so um, as a part of that long series of investigations, there are two series of um, two different kinds of practices that sometimes intersect that we're gonna talk about today. 
Um, one is called, we call them our intermediate suites. Um, we have a series of, of projects that have different nodes, um, investigating visual, literary, um, community uh, interactions, and, and of course, uh, sound installations are at the center of those. Our uh, series of intermediate suites are, are focused on uh, the notion of America. Um, and then the other body of work that we're gonna show works from our praise songs. And for us, um, praise songs, of course, uh, bring together the notion of a song and the notion of praise, but our, our ways of uh, investigating all the things that that can be take um, shape across a number of different forms. And so we'll talk about some of those different works in the different forms. Uh, so we'll start with maybe uh, one of the more recent pieces. Uh, this is uh, Blue Speaker for James Baldwin. This is a piece that we just uh, finished at the New School. And, and the building that you see here is uh, the New School's University Center in Manhattan. Uh, so it's on 14th Street and 5th Avenue. And uh, we were commissioned to make this project. Can you guys hear me? I'm kind of leaning away from the mic. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. So we were commissioned to make this piece uh, by the Vera List Center for Art and Politics at the New School and uh, Harlem Stage. Uh, and so they were commissioning a series of projects all about James Baldwin, and our project was one uh, of many done that year. Uh, so we really want, wanted to engage this new, this new building. Uh, so for our piece, uh, we sort of trace uh, the sort of glass facade of this building, uh, and we essentially turn the, the building itself into a speaker. So the glass facade um, traces the stairwells on three sides of the building, and so um, the different sides are used in different ways, and so the, the project lives in the different sides that way. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll show you some video uh, from the piece, and then uh, tonight as we go through the things, if, if you guys want to uh, sort of stop and ask any questions as we go, that's fine. Uh, so we'll show you a video, and then maybe we can talk some more about how the thing came together. lurked around us, and I understood at last that he could help us be free if we would listen, and he would never be free until we did. Sorry, I have to pause it for a second. Sorry, could you tell me if the audio is dropping out at the board? I'm, I'm getting... Okay, you're getting a signal? Okay. It wasn't like living with a person at all. It was like living with sound. And the sound didn't make any sense to her. Didn't make any sense to any of them, naturally.
All right, so that's a little bit of blue speaker. Apologize about that audio. All right, so we're gonna talk about uh, another piece that we're doing that's actually uh, in a new series that we're doing. Uh, these are a number series, and this piece is called Number Station Furtive Movements. Uh, and we just performed this piece at the Ryan Lee Gallery in Manhattan. Uh, so um, one of the things our projects, we try to do with our projects um, across a number of different um, studies is um, to think about how to sonify data. Um, this particular project, we use the um, self-reported numbers of stops and frisks in uh, New York City over the course of a number of years. Um, there are 123 precincts, not all of them report. Um, but we were interested in watching the way those numbers rose and fell um, during the stop and frisk period and after that it ended. Uh, so we'll play you just a small bit of this performance. The total performance is around 30 minutes. So I'm gonna stop it right there just to explain a bit about the, the, the process for this. So what you're hearing underscoring our reading are uh, basically we're taking the numbers of stops and translating those into frequencies. So if a certain precinct had you know, 300 stops for a quarter, then we translated that into a 300 hertz tone. Right? If they did 120 stops for a quarter, it's 120 hertz tone. Um, and, and so as we're reading these things, we're panning those things left and right uh, in the space. And we're also sort of broadcasting these things over shortwave radio. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we forgot to mention that point. And so we're, we're doing a series of these things, and they're all shortwave broadcasts uh, that are happening in spaces as performances and installations. So after this performance, the audio recording of the performance stayed in the space uh, during the exhibition period, uh, sort of playing on a loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're doing the next one uh, coming up at the Metropolitan Museum. And the next piece is uh, number station red records. And so we're, we're doing data from a, a book by Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, the journalist and activist. Uh, so she, she put out this book in 1895 called The Red Record, uh, which was a, a tabulation of lynching statistics across the United States. Um, and so, you know, we kind of think of her project as one of the like first big kind of American sort of uh, sort of data mining projects. So we're, we're looking at those numbers and we're gonna be translating those things into frequencies and performing them uh, at the Met along with another work. Mm -hmm. um, do you wanna say anything else? Uh, well, the only thing I'll say there, and we can get into this more during question and answer if people are interested, is that we um, were thinking about this along other kinds of chantings. So um, thinking about data, thinking about chanting, and, um, and yeah, we can say more about that later. Um, so the next project that we're going to show you is one called American Cipher, and this is also in, in the series. You that one? 
<laughs> this is also in the uh, suite, uh, the series of Americana suites. So this is another piece dealing with American history. And so for this work, uh, we were looking at the relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Um, and uh, we were commissioned to do this piece by Bucknell University, and we later adapted it uh, for the Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, and when we were asked to think about this relationship between Jefferson and Hemings, originally we didn't know uh, what we would say about it. Uh, you know, a lot had been written about, about their relationship. Uh, a lot of research had been done about it. And so, you know, as we started to sort of read much of the research and uh, to examine their relationship. One, we were looking for a sort of material connection to Sally Hemings. Do, do you all know the story of Jefferson and Hemings, right? So Sally Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's slave and... and Thomas she, Jefferson was an American president. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have to say that, it depends on where we are. Um, and uh, so they had children together and... and uh, depending on who you ask, and when you ask them, some people say these were definitely Thomas Jefferson's children. Some people say, well, it was only a rumor. Uh, so in our research process for American Cipher, we, we went to Thomas Jefferson's plantation, Monticello. And, you know, uh, have any of you been to Monticello? Has anybody been to Monticello? So, so, so a few people here. Uh, so I don't know what tour you took when you were there, but we took both the sort of slavery tour and the big house tour. And, and, and depending on which tour you took, you got a different version of, of this history. And that was surprising to us, right? So it's one organization that runs a plantation. But if you take the sort of slavery tour on Mulberry Row and you tour where the slave cottages were uh, and they talk about how people worked on the plantation, they'll tell you, well, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings had children together. Um, and we know this because of X, Y, and Z, and here's the history, and here's where their children went after they left the plantation. Here's where Sally lived, and this is probably why, and all of that. Yeah, now if you take the tour of the house, they tell you, well, it was a rumor, and we're not really sure what happened. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, thought, we thought it was amazing. These tours are really literally just feet away from each other. So it was, it was a really bizarre experience to have, just going a few feet and hearing a different official word. So we recorded these conversations, among many other things. Um, and, 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 and so we, you know, we went through Monticello and we went through the historical documents looking for a sort of object, a physical connection to Sally Hemings. And the one object at Monticello uh, that belonged to Sally Hemings was a small bell. Uh, now, this bell was the only object related to Sally Hemings, and it was actually passed down uh, through her family over several generations. It's not, it's not just the only object at Monticello. It's the only object that historians know of or that her family knows of. Uh, the, fa it, the family donated it to uh, Howard University, and it lives at Monticello. Uh, yeah, and um, so we got... I'm going to show you a picture of the bell, if I can find it here. Um, Uh, so, so, so that's Sally Hemings' bell. And uh, so when we got interested in it, we, we wanted to find a way to record it. And so, you know. We should say that it was given to her by uh, Martha Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's wife, um, and also, who was also Sally Hemings' half-sister. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, that was a fascinating relationship. Uh, and... So we wanted to find out how we could, you know, actually get access to the bell. So we talked to the people at Monticello. They said they don't own it. Uh, we made a number of calls to Howard University. And uh, basically, you know, both organizations had to okay uh, our sort of interaction with the bell. Uh, and so people were very concerned about what we would do with an image of this bell, which we thought was odd since it was the only thing associated with Sally Hemings. And it wasn't really on prominent display at Monticello. It was sort of tucked away in a corner. Um, but once they found out that we were actually doing a sort of sound-related project and we weren't really going to do a lot with the imagery, they were more than happy to let us ring the bell. They said, oh, you just want to ring it? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, who cares about a sound recording? <laughs> so, uh, so they let us uh, sort of go in and sort of perform with the bell and, and, and handle the bell once they found out, uh, you know, we weren't going to bring down the sort of Thomas Jefferson empire uh, with the bell. Um, so, so we'll play you a bit of what we did with it. And, and so we got really fascinated by the way DNA functioned in the story about him, Jefferson and Hemings. Yeah. yeah, so one of the things that we found is that the, the story about the children uh, of Sally Hemings 
being related to Thomas Jefferson changed um, in some institutions when the DNA evidence linked um, Sally Hemings' descendants to the other Thomas Jefferson descendants. And there's still people who dispute it, but a lot of people, um, although her descendants are around and have the story from her, passed down from her, uh, the DNA is what changed how some people talk about it. So we were interested in the idea that DNA is this um, thing that people understand as scientific, but it's a narrative and it carries stories and stories shape what we think the science can tell us. And so we became really interested in uh, American stories about DNA. And so this project has the Sally Hemings uh, and Thomas Jefferson story at the center of it, but there are other threads that connect to other American stories about DNA. Um, so the bell was a kind of physical and sonic stand-in for DNA in the project, mm -hmm. but we looked at a number of other stories and they show up in the project too in, in terms of, uh, well you'll see there's a bit of video animation and we did a number of letterpress prints associated with the project, but in it we sort of referred to stories about Barack Obama and DNA. There's a kind of interesting story with Oprah Winfrey and DNA. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this project that uh, sort of Henry Louis Gates uh, has been doing where he sort of analyzes the sort of DNA of celebrities and talks about their heritage, have you guys seen that? Um, you know, there are a couple of different versions of that show on TV now. Well, anyway, he analyzed Oprah Winfrey's DNA and before he could tell Oprah anything about her heritage, Oprah sort of came out to the press and said, uh, I'm a Zulu, my DNA shows it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that isn't what happened with the DNA in that, um, in that story, uh, but you know, and so some people, a lot of people had interesting responses to, to this story, including a, Zulu, a lot of Zulu people. Um, and a lot of people thought, well, this is really improbable since she's a descendant of probably West African people. Um, but we were really interested in, in, again, what she or anyone would want the DNA to say. What, what does it mean to have a desire for what your DNA will show people? And how does having one DNA, uh, what, your DNA point to one ancestry versus another, how does that play out? Um, so, so we'll show you a, a bit of what, what we made uh, with these sounds, uh, first starting with the Jefferson and Hemings project. So the first thing you'll see is a sound installation uh, done at Bucknell University. And in this work, we tried to sort of sonically create the sort of double helix shape in a public space.
what you'd like to see here is this is the second uh, iteration of the project that you see here. So we should also say that when you see the sort of double helix shape in the video, it, inside of that shape, uh, there's text there that sort of tell, uh, you know, our version of these other stories about DNA from popular culture. Uh, so we tell the story, like we mentioned, of Oprah Winfrey. There's also a story about uh, the person who was sort of released from prison uh, uh, through DNA overturning his case after serving the longest sentence. It was 34 years, a man named James Bain. And we also tell the story of a serial killer who was captured because of DNA evidence. And his story was notable because it was the first time someone was arrested because of DNA found in a familial database. I don't know if you guys know about these things, but now in certain states, the police can collect DNA material from you and they'll keep it in a file. And if someone else in your family commits a crime, they can uh, sort of identify you through uh, some state uh, maintained or federally maintained uh, DNA databases. And so we're interested in those stories, so those things pop up. The, the yeah. other thing that we should mention is that um, the, the sound of the bell um, has been altered, um, and we use the DNA of the Jefferson and Hemings um, descendants as a score for the pitching of those sounds. So that's part of what you hear when you hear the sound. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so th that's the American Cypher Project. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. We'll go back and, and, and show you sort of one more, uh, the sort of earliest. Well, well no, we'll, we'll do a free phase. Mm -hmm. uh, so free phase is another project that we uh, did last year. So free phase is another one in the Americana series. As, um, so it was, it's the one that follows um, uh, American Cypher that you just saw, um, but it happened last year. Uh, in, in the city of Chicago. And, and what you see in this image is this is a nighttime shot of a, of a large speaker on the rooftop of the Chicago Cultural Center. And, uh, and so there, there are three parts of this project, but this part with the speaker on the rooftop is called Beacon. Uh, we were commissioned by um, the Center for Black Music Research to do a project to activate their archives. And um, we chose to focus on the freedom songs in the archive. Now, we interpreted freedom songs in, in a broad way, but um, as you may know, there were songs that were sung during the time of slavery that people sang for encouragement and also to send messages. Um, a lot of these songs were reinterpreted in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement, uh, and other songs were added to that uh, canon. And then there are songs that are in that tradition that are contemporary that have been uh, made along that time. And so we, we looked for songs along that spectrum in the archive and collected 150 um, songs And so these different nodes of the project um, are different ways of interpreting those songs and the tradition that they come from. All right. so, so Beacon deals with the song as signal. And so we'll, we'll show you a little bit of, uh, of how Beacon functioned. Um,
so I'll stop there and just try to tell you a little bit about uh, how uh, those phrases, those melodic phrases, uh, were, were working uh, during each time of the day. So in the morning, uh, we played a phrase from a song, Arise, Shine, for the light's coming, right? So, so as Mindy mentioned, these were old spirituals that sort of dated back at least to the 1800s. Uh, sort of midday, we played the piece that you heard. I woke up this morning with my mind set on freedom. Um, and then in the evening, we played a piece uh, that we thought was appropriate for the evening. So we used phrases uh, from the song, Keep Your lamp, Lamps Trimmed. Um, and, and in terms of the sound that we were working with there, we wanted the sound that would both sort of remind people maybe of a church bell that they'd hear in public because in, in this part of downtown Chicago, there was a church bell maybe about a mile away that you could hear uh, that would usually sort of chime a few minutes before our signal started. Um, uh, but we wanted to remind people of church bells, but you know, some of these songs aren't likely to be the kind of things that you hear on, on most church bells. So Keep Your Lamps Trim, for example, was a much more sort of bluesy piece than the kind of thing you'd normally hear uh, in that kind of sort of public chime. Uh, the other thing I should mention about it is that our parabolic speaker uh, was pointed. You can see in some of the images here that we're sort of focusing down on this public space, this public park, and that's Millennium Park in Chicago. And um, you know, we wanted to sort, sort of focus on that area because it's an area that's kind of known for uh, public artworks. And so, so you know, we were aiming for this area where people naturally congregate, but we also kind of wanted to maybe hit the Anish Kapoor silver bean. <laughs> um, and uh, the other thing about how uh, the sound was working in the piece is that if you were in the park, then you heard this really direct signal uh, coming from the rooftop of the building. Uh, but if you were on entering in any of the entrances for the Chicago Cultural Center, then you heard vocals from the piece, so you actually heard the lyrics being sung. You couldn't hear that in the park. You only heard the chime in the park, but if you were sort of on the sides of the building, you could actually hear a choir sort of singing lyrics. We, reco we recorded a choir sort of doing phrases from these songs, so it was time with the chime. It was synchronized with the chime, but you only heard those vocals if you were sort of, uh, sort of in the perimeter of the building. Uh, so that, that's a little bit about how, how Beacon worked. Um, the next part of the project, uh, we did a piece called Overcome. And with Overcome, uh, we went to the Edmus, Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, uh, the site of uh, Bloody Sunday in 1965. And so we recorded the sounds of the, of, of the, of the bridge itself. Uh, so we recorded ambient sounds from, from the structure with a number of contact microphones. Uh, and we used those, the sounds from the structure itself uh, to kind of reinterpret the song, We Shall Overcome. And so we did this as a sort of four channel piece. And so it's a four channel audio video installation. I mean, the video is one channel, but there are four channels of audio. So it plays back like a quad piece. Uh, so I'll play you just a couple of minutes of that, and then I'll show you the last part of this piece, Free Phase. stop it there because our audio is not working. <laughs> um, uh, so I can talk to you some more about how these pieces work uh, until we have audio. Um, 
So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about the last piece. Um, yeah, yeah, we need to come back. Yeah. So the, the last uh, piece of, of that project is called um, Dialogues. And um, we were able to... We were able to get a, a group of um, Chicago DJs of different generations um, to, together to talk about the, the archive at the uh, Center for Black Music Research and, and really just their sense of the body of work that we could call Freedom Songs. And they all had really different perspectives. So um, especially, you know, some of it was generational, so that part was very interesting. Um, but what we did is in the Chicago Cultural Center, we had um, a group of DJs, two or three at a time, um, at a desk with an iPad filled <coughs> with um, of recordings from the Center for Black Music Research. And some of these were digital uh, recordings that they had, and some of them were digitized for the project. Um, uh, did, did you mention the number? So we had 150 mm -hmm. Freedom Songs. Um, and so we were thinking about the time since, since uh, emancipation. Uh, <coughs> So this is in an open public space. So as people wandered th through the space, we invited them to sit down with the DJ and they could choose uh, from this list of freedom songs and, and they could have a dialogue with the DJ about them. N now the DJs had a wide range of experience. Like one mm -hmm. of our DJs there, Mike, uh, has been DJing since the late 70s. So he's a kind of veteran of the club music scene in Chicago. Uh, and, and so it was a kind of cross-generational mix of DJs. Mm -hmm. the, um, the youngest was in her early 20s. So. She wasn't born when Mike Ezebuku started DJing. You know, so. And, and so, so they brought their sort of own experience of, of club music, but even their own experience of, of these freedom songs and spirituals uh, to play in the conversations. So um, as with some of our earlier projects, um, we gave them a list of questions to ask um, the, the, the audience member who came up to have a conversation with them. But as you can see, that's DJ Fathom right there. They, they all have their own personalities and their own body of knowledge. And so when that conversation took off, it went in a lot of different directions. Well, I just want to say for the record that I'm not playing audio now. I don't want our friend at the board to freak out. So I'm not oh, playing okay. audio. <laughs> so, so there's no signal here. Um, uh, so these, these dialogues, we imagine they might be sort of short sort of, you know, 10 to 15 minute conversations and listening sessions, but some people stayed for an hour to talk to, talk to one DJ. Some people came back several times a day mm -hmm. to sort of engage in dialogue with these DJs. So we recorded these conversations and we're transcribing them uh, for, for a book. And so uh, people had a lot of sort of fascinating <coughs> stories to tell about their knowledge and their experience with these songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also, the cultural center is also sort of a crossroad, so some people were getting off the train, you know, just passing through the city on their way uh, to other cities or to other countries. And so those things all sort of inspired a lot of sort of interesting conversations of, about this material. Uh, so so, so that, that was the last part uh, of the project. Um, Do you want to try Overcome? Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll try to play a little bit more of Overcome, see if we have any luck. If not, we'll stop and take questions. Still getting the word gating. Okay. okay, so we're gonna stop there and take questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. okay. So in the um, in the the number station piece, of course, the number station refers back to the the sort of Soviet communist era broadcasts yeah. over shortwave. In those um, broadcasts, there's uh, in principle, though it's hard to actually verify that there's small bits of actual useful information mm -hmm. in amongst a bunch of noise. Mm -hmm. And what you've done in, in your piece was take statistics, which are self-reported. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't want to answer the same problem. <laughs>
You can explain later that what you do is you pick up the mic and then you drop it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what you, you've done in, in that piece is t uh, take bits of uh, numbers that are data, but which have some uh, ambiguity around them since they're self-reported. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed, it, it seemed to me that this was um, one, and you can correct me here if I've sort of read this uh, sort of askew, um, the, the, the space between the thing that's in, encoded in, in what you appear to be information and all the things around it that may be um, similar but unreadable or simply blank is kind of a, uh, uh, an important part of your area of inquiry. Um, and I wonder if you could just uh, talk about that some more, if in fact that premise is... is yeah, yeah I mean... There, there are a lot of things that are um, that are not traceable in the data. I mean, they're self-reported numbers. There are precincts that never reported. Um, I mean, even it, I, I'm not, I'm not sure why this is, but we we got our numbers, our statistics from the ACLU, which made them public. Um, but even. Each year's, each, it's where they're repeated, they're reported quarterly. Even the different quarters' information uh, is made public in a different format, and so uh, it, the th tracing that, getting that information, it was not exactly. It wasn't the same process to get all the information, even though it was all public. Really bizarre little quirks of just the process of trying to get the data. Um, But yeah, that space between what actually happens, what is never even um, tracked at all. Um, and then there's also, there's also the language around it. So this piece is called number station furtive movements. Furtive movements is the term that is most frequently listed as the reason for a stop when you have stop and frisk. Um, and one can imagine the reason why it is that most frequently uh, listed reason is because it can be anything. Anything can be identified as a furtive movement. Um, so, you know, there are other things that ha there are reasons that are given for a stop, whether they're true or not, that's another thing. But there are other reasons that can, you can say this happened or this didn't happen. But that is one that's an open, <laughs> open space. So yeah, there's a lot that we're interested in around that and what that holds. Um, and our question for ourselves was how to make the data uh, felt, how to feel it. Um, and it is necessarily abstract, uh, you know, because there's no, there's so much that you can't know to have a feeling about, you know. I mean, I would say the other thing there for us is, um, you know, these number station broadcasts that I guess people have known about from the 50s until the present. They still exist, you know, if you tune in the shortwave radio. Uh, we were kind of interested also, in our case, you know, uh, this data released by the NYPD was not supposed to be secretive. It was supposed to be a, so, sort of a disclosure. Uh, but we we're kind of interested in what can be hidden in a disclosure, right? So, so what, what's not there? So these numbers are reported, but there's still so much we don't know about these interactions, right? There's still so much that's not sort of recorded in this database. And, and, and uh, so, you know, so that, I mean, that's a carryover through a, no, through a number of our projects. So we collected this data, you know, in a given, in, in a given database, but what is it that we don't know? What, what's not there in, in the database? And, and sometimes you have to, you can't put more language on it. So somehow you have to, you have to feel the data in order to meditate on what's not there in the database. I would also say that, that the process of getting the data and figuring out you know, how we're going to place it visually and sonically um, is itself a meditative process, you know, is itself a process for feeling it too, because I don't walk around with the numbers right now, but for a while I knew what precincts had the most stops. And the precincts, interestingly, with the most stops and the least stops in certain quarters were right next to each other. So I had a feel for, you know, parts of New York City. Um, first, just by number, 
and then when I looked it up, I could map it to, lo to locations. But you know, you, that, that, the places with the most stops, could be right next to the places with the, the fewest stops. And the numbers were from the hundreds, from like 400 or 500 to two in a quarter, two stops to 500. You know, why would that stop? at an arbitrary border. Well, no, there's something about the way it's hap the policing is happening. Right? Uh, uh, I mean, we, we should also say, not to go on about this piece yeah. forever, but um, you know, uh, whistleblowers from the NYPD have also said that all of these numbers are manipulated, right? So, so uh, they've shaped those numbers in order to show improvement in some cases, right? So you give a low number one year, so you can give a higher number the next year. So all of these numbers are created, so, so it's a, it's a creative database. So in some way, we kind of saw ourselves as collaborating with the NYPD, right? They did, they did their creative part, and then, and then we responded to this kind of score they gave us. Um, so yeah. um, you said just a minute ago you were talking about like the experience of kind of feeling the data and feeling the spaces in that. Um, I'm just curious, when you're making a piece or designing a piece, and thinking about the way an audience is going to interact with it when you're you know, using like, DNA as a score for something or you're turning these uh, reported numbers into frequencies or projecting sound into a park where you know, people don't necessarily know what they're listening to. How, how important is it that your audience knows what they're listening to or how do you, how do you deal with trying to figure out how much your audience knows or whether that's important or not? That's a good question. Yeah, um, I, I think it, it depends on the project, but also that's something that um, we've had a shifting relationship to over the years. So uh, at first it was really important for the audience to know, you know, the things that we were dealing with. At, at this point, um, it's important for us to know all of those things and have really good dialogue about that, but then to sort of single down, you know, to, to focus. Uh, what we share. But with Number Station, it was pretty important that people know what those numbers were. Um, um, in part because the, the language was all numbers, right? <laughs> so it's hard for people to have a feeling about numbers. Um, but that was also part of the experiment, you know, to, to, to not put other language around the sound itself so that people could say, oh, I'm listening to uh, data. I'm listening to the numbers from Stop and Frisk, and then try to find their way around it. You know, um, and people told us interesting stories about how they did that. So, but it's important to balance what the project is against um, how it functions. Yeah, I guess I'd also say that you know we think about the public artworks differently from things in a gallery, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So if people are coming to a gallery, they may not know that they're coming to hear a particular piece, but they come with a certain set of assumptions that we don't expect people to have when they're walking through a public park. Right? So, so, you know, the context affects what we assume that people will bring to the work, yeah. Hi there. So I wonder if you could speak to your process of collaboration. Um, I mean, it's clear you have a partnership professionally and also in, in your lives. And I wonder, when you work together, do you each have an area of specialization? Like, does one, does one person focus more on the technology and the other one does the, more the historical research? Or is it, do you both do both? I just wonder how, how that process of, of collaboration works for the two of you. Um. <laughs> I'm not avoiding it. Like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, we, we come from different uh, knowledge, but I think most of what we do, we each have a hand in. Um, and so it, it, it shakes out differently in different ways. But. So all the projects kind of grow out of these kind of ongoing dialogues that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and the roles we play are pretty organic. You know, we kind of, we kind of figure out what we can do for, for each project. Uh, so, so there, so they're pretty organic. I mean, um, Mindy has sort of more uh, of a formal, more formal training in research. Um, I have more formal training with the technology, but that's not really how the things sort of play out in the studio, right? Uh, because we, 
we were working together as we studied, right? So, you know, she learned about researchers, I learned about technology, the other person was right there, and so. I mean, it, it, we grew up together, so. Yeah, so I mean, I knew, what I knew about research at 11 was considerably less. Than, than now, uh, so we, we, yeah, we were right there. Um. But yeah, so it, it, yeah, everything kind of grows out of the dialogues, and so it's hard to say, like, you know, many of these projects when I look back, and I don't really remember who did, who did what. You know, I kind of remember when we came up with certain ideas, but I don't remember, you know, exactly who did what in a lot of the things. Um, hi, my, my question is about, so I was curious with the number stations piece and then with the Sally Hemming piece. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, interested in the fact that like the feedback or the composition um, respectively were like really, um, like I found pleasing sounding and like easy to listen to. So that was interesting because like, I, you know, part of the composition was coming just from values and not from just like sort of doing whatever you wanted. So I was wondering like if that, what, if that felt like an accident, like you stumbled upon something sort of like pleasing or beautiful or if that was purposeful and if so, like what's the importance of having something that isn't sonically abrasive? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, once again, it kind of depends on like what experiences we bring to it. So, um, you know, as we're making the thing, we're, we're thinking about a work like that as a space for meditation, right? Like how does someone meditate on a database of violence, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, maybe if you haven't heard a lot of electronic music that sounds like that, it might sound a bit abrasive, yeah. right? Um, um, so, you know, we're conscious of the fact, for example, that it sounds like uh, maybe uh, older kinds of electronic music, you know, maybe sort of some modernist electronic stuff from an earlier period. And so we're, we're interested in, like, can, can that form address something like, you know, can sort of electronic sounds uh, that are reminiscent of modernism address the same kind of questions that maybe the blues has addressed in the past, right? And so those are some of the questions we're asking ourselves. And um, yeah, are you gonna say something? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. But yeah. uh, you can finish your sentence. No, I'm, cu I'm curious, I wanna know what you're gonna say. Well, okay, <laughs> I, a couple of thoughts. I, I think improvisation is part of the work, is, you know, formally. Um, um, we do think of the work as music and art at the same time we want it to function. We, we want it to function in a way that pleases us. Um, in part because we don't want that, um, that pleasure or that um, cultural perspective or that, um, that part of music that is a taste to be absent. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the things that we've struggled with and um, been happily challenged by is what the cultural values associated with um, black music traditions can say in these kind of, uh, against these kind of conceptual um, practices that often have space for um, what is perceived to be white music. You know what I mean? Like there's, art rock is a whole thing that people understand, but um, you know, art blues is, is trickier for audiences uh, sometimes, and curators, you know? And we've been interested to put pressure on those assumptions about what kinds of things that people understand to be music and function in an art context. Going back to the New School installation, uh, I know you mentioned briefly that you used some recordings from Ambient Sounds in Queens. Harlem. Harlem. 
Uh, Harlem, sorry. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about your sampling and manipulation techniques and uh, also if there's any sort of live interaction in the installation from uh, either the outside or inside environment. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, as you mentioned, there are a lot of field recordings from Harlem and, and we chose those locations based on uh, where James Baldwin lived at a couple of points in his life, um, and we just took that from the literature, right? Um, but we also lived in the same area just by coincidence. Uh, so we did a lot of field recordings around where we used to live. Uh, there wasn't a lot of manipulation to the things other than shaping the things, right? And, and sort of selecting things for certain qualities. And then we tried to match those ambiences recorded in Harlem with uh, areas of activity um, downtown, right? So, so at certain moments we wanted uh, we wanted to go with the flow of natural sounds uh, around sort of 14th Street and 5th Avenue. Other times we wanted to push against things, right? So the 5th Avenue side of the building is a kind of heavy traffic area, right? Um, and so we put the sound of traffic there at certain moments, and other times we bring up something that you couldn't hear in that area, right? So it would be a, a close proximity recording of, of kids playing basketball on the playground. And so inside that building, you can't really hear the sound from outside. The windows don't open, right? So if you're looking out the window, it might seem very natural for a minute that you're hearing ambience of traffic passing by until you notice that you don't hear traffic through those windows, <laughs> all right? And, 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 and then it becomes really obvious when all of a sudden it switches to a sort of close proximity sort of basketball game, right, uh, that emerges from the traffic. Um, there are other things that sort of shape you know, how we put things in that space. We, we spent, you know, a couple of months watching how people use the building, right? So there's some areas where students pass through very quickly, some places where people hung out and did work, some places where people hung out but they never worked there, they just hung out. And so, you know, if it's a space where people get hang out a lot but not work, we could introduce sort of more kind of discrete musical ideas, right? So we, we would play a blues song, right? If it was a, a place where people worked, then that affected how we shape things. So we just introduce a tone for maybe, you know, 15 minutes at a time. And then you could pull the tone out so people could feel the sort of dropout. Um, another thing that, sh that affected what we did is in watching the patterns of people move through the space, we realized that people played music in the building during certain hours. Um, and different people played different kinds of music. So the students who studied sort of in the middle of the building and played a certain kind of pop music. And then there are the sort of design students who worked in their studio who came in the next couple of hours and they played a different kind of music, you know, kind of darker rock thing. And then people, then the work crew would come to clean the building late at night and then they would play their own music. And so all of those things shifted the kind of tones we put in the space and the kind of things we tried to play with or push against um, in the sort of shaping of space. So different things in the different sides of the building. Um. The, the, the text, I, I don't know how much you could hear of this, the text that we use from Baldwin were different um, from different things. So there's this, this, the short story, Sonny's Blues, which um, has a lot of, in addition to being a story about a blues musician through the eyes of his brother, um, it, there's a lot about listening and about what it means for us to listen and really hear um, each other. Um, there's also text about black speech and black music and what it does. And then there's also um, the language from a speech given to educators um, in which Baldwin suggests that our, the real goal of education is for us to um, look outside the walls. And um, we, you know, we try to draw people to the windows uh, and kind of feel and, and think about that. Um, but in terms, so, so in terms of interactivity, a lot of it was um, in that, but also we had a series of readings of the short story by blues musicians there um, on Fridays. And so they would come and read in whatever way they wanted to, and they read very different ways, and then have a conversation with the audience. So um, um, different people did different things. One person read it all the way through from beginning to end, one person had two copies of the text and read different sections in different orders. Um, one person read a little bit from the beginning, a little bit from the end, and a little bit about the color indigo, which is her favorite color. <laughs> you know, and so they did very different things, and they also 
the ways that they read had something to do with how they live with the blues. And so we had interesting conversations about that too, the, the music and the literature through each other's process. Um, um, so that was an interesting way that interactivity played out in the, in the installation. Um, the last thing about that, I should say, is that um, we were also interested in the choice for that building. It was a new construction. Mm -hmm. And so we're interested in the politics of putting this sort of glass structure in the middle of downtown Manhattan in a, in a school, you know, for, for a university. Um, and so we thought a lot about that as a, as a kind of optimistic gesture, and we read a lot about the sort of optimism implied by glass architecture. And um, Baldwin is not that optimistic, right? And, and so, so we're interested in having Baldwin talk back to this architectural choice. So, so that's another thing that we were thinking about in the piece. Hi, first of all, thank you. Um, it's so great to see uh, an overview of your work. It's absolutely brilliant. So I have a question about um, the archive, mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's such a um, great intervention into the question of the archive in terms of its representation or not of slavery, right? Mm -hmm. So the argument is that if you look for the archive for slavery, what one gets are numbers and they're fundamentally dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And what you do in terms of making those numbers resonate differently um, is absolutely fascinating, both in terms of the narratives you reveal, but also make us question what we think we already know mm -hmm. through these narratives. But I was thinking about the ways in which sound remains and bleeds. Um, and if you could talk a little bit more of how you see sound as, um, as um, intervening into these questions of what can remain, mm. um, because it remains in ways that can't be seen but resonate, um, but also invade and, are, and is unruly in certain ways. Yeah. That is really intriguing. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of what I think about this, and I'm not sure uh, if Keith will say something different or not, is um, more about, you know, in, in terms of sound remaining, is, is more uh, about the excitement of knowing what's possible than it necessarily is about actually the experience of sound insulation. Um, so, the idea, I remember reading or having, being at some conference and there was a, I think he might have been an audiologist who used the word reflection to talk about um, the sound, how long a sound physically remains in a space. You know, you can walk through, a, first you can walk through a reflection and then that it's still there long after it's heard. And just the idea of that you know, aside from what people actually are conscious of or what actually affects them, the idea that if I say a word, it's in the room much longer than anyone can hear it, uh, and that it's actually a vibration, it's actually, you know, against my body in the room <laughs> much longer than I can track it, is a really powerful idea that, that excites me about, um, excites me about using sound, but also makes me very, um, interested in being precise and, and um, intentional. Um, that said, then, then my experience of sound is another exciting thing, but those ideas are a little, are not exactly the same thing. Um, yeah, I, I would say in terms of how, how I think about it, sound kind of in, interacting with, with history, is that generally um, we think of the things that we see as the things that we know are true, and, and then sound deals with the things that we kind of believe or we have faith in. Um, so sound is kind of, you know, it's always dealing with the invisible. And so, so for me, uh, uh, that's why I can function in order to talk about these kind of invisible things, you know, from the historical record, right? Because they're already things that we believe or that we feel, and so sound is a great way to sort of represent the things that are not clearly represented in the archive, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.